Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us. Uh, my name is Giulia Pavesi. I'm a PhD researcher here at the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at SPU Leuven. And it's my great pleasure to host and moderate today's webinar on the future of global space governance and proactive multilateralism at the UN level. This lecture will provide an overview on how UN USA is contributing to install a proactive multilateral approach to ensure the entire community, both public and private stakeholders, are engaging in the decision-making process that will define the future of global space governance. In fact, our distinguished speaker today is UNUSA Director Dr. Simonetta Di Pippo, who is the current leader of the UNUSA Strategic Policy and Programmatic Activities and advising the UN Secretary General on Space Affairs. Prior to joining UNUSA, Dr. Di Pippo served as Director of Human Space Flight at the European Space Agency and previously also as Director of the Observation of the Universe at the Italian National Space Agency. She's an academician of the IAEA and a member of World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Space Technologies since 2016 and is co-chair since 2020. She co-founded Women in Aerospace Europe in 2009 and in 2017 became a UN International Gender Champion. She holds an honoris causa degree in Environmental Studies and an honoris causa degree of Doctor in International Affairs. Mrs. Di Pippo was also knighted by the President of the Italian Republic in 2006 and in 2008 the International Astronomical Union assigned the name Di Pippo to an asteroid in recognition of her efforts in space exploration. She was also featured in a publication, Her Story, a celebration of leading women in the United Nations, a tribute to women's participation in the development of the UN. And among other awards, she was awarded the Hubert Korean Award in 2018 as the first woman laureate. Two small remarks before we start with these excellent um, panelists. We couldn't have a better speaker. The presentation will last approximately an hour, an hour and a half, and then the Q&A will follow. Please make sure to submit your questions already during the lecture in the dedicated question box. You should find it on the right uh, side of your screen. This lecture is also recorded and will be published afterwards on our YouTube channel. And now, without further ado, the 30 people, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it is really a pleasure for me to talk about uh, the UN and what we do, in particular in terms of uh, proactive multilateralism, dealing with global space governance, and uh, with all the interesting and trendy topics we are dealing with right now, I believe that this uh, lecture is really timely and I really welcome questions from, from the participants here. And, uh, and it's really an interesting moment to be in this field because it's, uh, it's really blooming from several perspectives. So as, as was said, uh, we really talk about proactive multilateralism and we talk about the future of global space governance. And the two things are strictly connected and uh, because you know we really strive to, to foster uh, international cooperation, which we believe is, uh, is the backbone of the future uh, for maintaining the peaceful uses of outer space. The next one, please. Well, if we want to talk about space developments in, with focus on contemporary and emerging trends, well, in order to give you a little bit of structure, I divided the topics uh, under three pillars, science and technology, economy, and legal and policy. It's just uh, a system, let's say a framework to give you a little bit of structure in the, um, in the, in the discussion. Uh, but you will see that a lot of these topics are in reality, in reality interconnected. And so they may uh, belong to different pillars. Uh, so if we talk about science and technology first, the first point that I would like to mention is that uh, there's been a huge increase in terms of number of uh, satellites launched and therefore the number of objects in space, uh, active and space debris, is really growing um, at, the, uh, uh, at the speed which was not even expected uh, or not, I mean it was not the clear forecast of this kind of increase with this with this rate. Um, we uh, witness and we are witnessing an increase in, uh, in the number of stakeholders, state and non-state, 
capable of the developing and launching hardware uh, in space. Uh, we also uh, see, uh, also because we have the register of the objects launched into outer space, which since 59 is collecting all the information related to objects launched into outer space. Well, uh, we now know that small satellites are the leading hardware being launched in space. Um, we also know and we all witness the fact that uh, mega constellations are coming online. You probably heard that, uh, for example, Elon Musk uh, with the, his um, Starlink constellation already got the approval uh, from the American authorities, from the US authorities, of about 13,000 satellites. Uh, you know that OneWeb is also a um, few hundreds uh, of satellites and, and also for a few thousand of satellites um, already approved for, um, for Jeff Bezos uh, constellation. But at the same time, it's quite a recent information just a few weeks ago uh, it came public. Uh, it became public on the on the on the media that also the Chinese um, are got the approval for launching something like thirteen thousand satellites again for a single mega mega constellation. So while this is really dealing with bridging the space divide, but also the digital divide, well at the same time is something that we have to monitor uh, because this. Uh, this speed at uh, this pace in sending satellites in orbit may create soon some some issues some challenges let's say that we have to face um we have uh, an increasing access to uh, space uh, or i would say space is becoming more and more accessible uh, but this uh, also is is a question which is dealing with let's say half of the member states of the United Nations. We have 193 member states and more or less half of them have access to space, which means that we still have a long way to go. And there are also some new technologies uh, um, popping up, which integrated with space technologies can give a boost, an additional boost to, uh, to the situation in, in the field. And now if we move to economy, uh, it's extremely important to notice that currently space economy is valued at around 400 billion US dollars. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, the, uh, the forecast, like, let's call it like that, that it will be a trillion, uh, a trillion uh, economy, uh, a trillion US dollars value, uh, around 2040. It's still a projection, but it's quite realistic. Also, another important element is that if we look at the situation, you see that the commercial activities in space are covering more or less 80% of the overall value, and that uh, private companies are expanding themselves in fields that we are not uh, traditional for them more traditionally linked to, uh, to government uh, expenditures. Uh, also, we have to underline the satellites contribute to more than 10% to GDP, uh, to the GDP of a uh, few countries. We have evidence in EU, Germany, UK, others. Um, so there are studies reporting this uh, for these countries, uh, but we expect that uh, this will become even more and more evident in the future where other countries will make the same assessment in, in their own situation. And um, uh, specific for this period, but in general, uh, when we deal with a big challenge which is, um, which is impacting all, all of humanity, um, well, satellites have been really instrumental during the COVID-19 pandemic. But it would be the, the, the satellite industry, the satellite field, the satellite technologies in data, I mean, space-based data, will be even more instrumental for what we call the post-COVID-19 recovery phase and really in, in trying to push towards a greener economy. If we look at the legal and policy area, it's clear that space stakeholders and policy makers are really working on addressing novel issues uh, arising from 
what we call new space. So there is a need of enhancing the safety, security, and sustainability of other space activities. Uh, there is an increased need for international cooperation, also in fields which we are not so um, so prominent, I would say, in the recent past. I'm talking about planetary defense, but even planetary protection, because the more we uh, think about going to the moon or, or exploring Mars or other uh, celestial bodies, well, it, become, it becomes more and more important really to uh, protect the planet, but also protect the other celestial bodies we are going to visit. Uh, and then we have also, uh, we need an enhanced understanding and implementation of the international space law frameworks. Uh, last but not least, uh, member states uh, in the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPIUS, um, will, uh, um, will uh, probably finalize in the next coming months at the time of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space session this year, which has been postponed to the normal June timeframe to August, uh, end of August, beginning of September this year, due to the pandemic. And this is a, an agenda, a bold agenda, which will uh, um, address the key topics of the future of space until 2030 under the umbrella of the committee and under the umbrella of the UN. The next one, please. So, in a nutshell, the Office for Outer Space Affairs can be considered as the UN home for space. Uh, we are the only entity in the UN Secretariat dealing with 100% to space affairs. And we're, we work with a lot of different players, so with national governments, with space agencies, with private entities, with civil society, including academia and NGOs, and also other UN entities in Vienna, in New York, in Geneva, and in other, uh, in other locations, but also in the fields. So we really try, in the field, we try to have connections with all the representatives of the UN in the various countries to really reach, um, reach out in the best possible way, uh, in particular developing and emerging countries. And, um, and also we strive for, uh, uh, to, I mean, to foster innovation also through diversity and inclusiveness, which are uh, really important elements through partnerships uh, and networking uh, and, uh, and this is also linked to what uh, to one of the SDGs, the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You know that in September 2015, the UN approved the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular, number 17 is dealing with partnerships for the goal, inviting the UN to find new ways of de developing partnerships to get uh, really the full support of all the stakeholders to becoming more more relevant uh, for the future we want. The next one, please. And again, in a nutshell, uh, the main goal of the Office for Outer Space Affairs, uh, in, in all the ways possible, uh, we really want to support member states. We are here to support member states. And we do it uh, serving uh, the committee and the peaceful use on the peaceful uses of outer space and its subcommittees. And that's one way for us to serve member states. And the other way is really to be a capacity builder. So the entire office right now is a capacity builder. Um, we provide information, space-based data, build capacity to allow uh, member states to accelerate sustainable development. Uh, overall, we are a sort of a platform. We facilitate international cooperation among UN member states, and uh, we also help them to develop new space policies and to adhere to the international space law frameworks. And again, we can consider us as the getaway uh, for, uh, for space in the UN system. We also coordinate, um, in a way, the contributions of all the other UN entities to uh, which fulfill their own mandates, so, uh, getting space as a tool for supporting. And it's also extremely important that we, uh, in a way, we connect all the dots. We have a huge network of experts all over the world, and, and we try always to understand when there is a need for us to, to be present with the new initiative linked to the SDGs, but also linked to the needs and requirements of member states. The next one, please. 
Um, here you see uh, that's the place uh, where we live, the Vienna International Center in Vienna, Austria, uh, where is the, the main location of, of the Office for Outer Space Affairs. Indeed, we have also, also other two other um, offices, one in Beijing, supported by uh, the Chinese government, and the other one in Bonn, supported by the German government, uh, but they both deal with the UN Spider program. It's a, it's a program approved by the General Assembly in 2006 as an, is a platform for space-based information for disaster management and emergency response. So it's really focusing on how to support member states in providing them with space-based data and services uh, to support the uh, management of the disaster cycle and in particular the emergency response phase, even if we try also to deal a little bit with early warning. Uh, but then, as I mentioned already, we act uh, as the Secretariat of COPOS in the subcommittees. We serve also as the Executive Secretariat of two bodies, which are not uh, which are not uh, part of COPOS, but reporting to COPOS in a way or another. One is the International Committee on Global Navigation Satellite System, where we put together all the service providers, all, all the providers of the GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, which means mainly Russians with GLONASS, uh, Chinese with Beidou, Europeans with Galileo, and Americans with the US with GPS, but also the others were coming, Japanese and Indians, who are starting with their own constellation in GNSS. Um, and all together with the providers, we also put together, you know, we, we, we gather the users, uh, the users which are interested in, in working uh, more and more with this system, with an interoperable approach and uh, this is also quite a good mechanism it's a sort of a role model for uh, coordination for international cooperation and coordination on a global scale uh, the little bit different but still extremely important is SAMPAGE, the space mission planning advisory group which is created a little bit more recently and is dealing with planetary defense and uh, in making uh, assessment and preparing for potential uh, threat coming from a potential impact with an asteroid and uh, we serve as i said as the uh, permanent secretariat of of this group and then we have uh, i mentioned already the register of the object launch into outer space which is a, a, a responsibility that we discharge from the secretary general we coordinate as i said uh, all the contributions of all the un entities um, in this in the space field, uh, even if, as I said, we are the only one having 100% uh, space as a mandate, the other use space as a tool to support the fulfillment of their own mandates. And then the program of space application, which is an historical one dealing with capacity building, which, by the way, has been um, changing a lot in the way in which we really do capacity building uh, in order to be a little bit more fit for purpose in the 21st century with the current situation, which for sure is not the same situation that we had in the past. The next, uh, the next one, please. Well, if we want to talk about trends and topics for 2021, uh, well, I would say that we can uh, summarize it saying that we really want to bridge the space divide. The space divide is really the difference between the spacefaring countries and the countries which still need to develop certain technologies in order to um, to be able to uh, to proceed properly and to support the socio-economic sustainable development in their own country and so therefore to uh, improve the quality of life of their own citizens um, well there are some elements that we need to underline first of all as i mentioned already more than half of the un member states never had the satellite in orbit Dozens of countries still lack cap capabilities to use space tech for sustainable development, disaster management, climate action, etc. Uh, national space economies are non-existent or only slowly emerging in many countries around the world. And sustainability today means also prosperity tomorrow. So there is a strong link between the, uh, the bridging the space divide action and developing a socioeconomic um, sustainable situation in each country, in particular developing and emerging. 
At the same time, uh, we believe that equality is a human right, but it's also uh, much more. Um, we believe that inclusiveness and diversity spark innovation, generate revenues and bring new perspectives. And so we really focus a lot on this on these topics. Uh, we really deal a lot with the with gender equality. Um, we clearly experience and witness the fact that the gender gap in space industry still prevails. In less than 25% of the workforce is represented by women, only 25%. Uh, we also uh, always keep in mind that 90% of future jobs will require ICT skills and companies are already struggling with the talent pool. And as I always say, we cannot uh, win the game. Uh, we cannot even think about uh, playing, but not even, uh, even less winning if we keep half of the team um, uh, out of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the game field. Uh, and so we really need to uh, select by merit and not by gender or by any other, let's say, element. Just merit should be uh, the, 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 the distinctive element. And so that's the reason why when we look at the challenge of the future of jobs, we really need to look at the talent pool that we can develop. This is true in developed, but also in developing countries. And then the voices of young people are becoming more vocal than ever before. However, their perspective really needs to, to, be, um, to be considered. Their voices need to be heard. And, uh, and so in policy and decision-making processes, we always try to inject the view of the youth. The next one, please. And if we want to look a little bit at our activities and capacity building, I would like to mention that, um, again, when in 2015, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was approved, uh, together with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, what we did was to remap all our current at that time and future activities uh, linked to uh, to what we uh, we we do uh, in the sense that these activities were to be linked to the SDGs. For example, uh, space for water didn't exist before 2015. Space for water is addressing is is mainly um, devoted to use space-based data. Uh, to support the water communities. And so it's really a, a bridge between the space and the water communities. And it's a repository of information, a database of best practices. We, also, we, we host some interesting conversations, papers, um, opinions, et cetera. And all of this helps really to exchange views and to have a a one-stop uh, shop where you can find a lot of information related to this topic. Well, this project didn't exist before and because we noticed that we didn't have a project which was strongly linked to SDG number six, which is clean water and sanitation. Uh, but Space for Water is also linked to a lot of other things, it's linked to disasters, it links to climate action, it's linked to land use, a lot of other things, but the main topic was try. Let's try to have a project which is really addressing the uh, SDG number six, and we did this with um, uh, with several of the projects you see or the initiative you see here. Uh, well, UN Spider, as I mentioned, was there since 2006 when the GA resolution was approved, uh, approving the program. But still, um, we wanted to link more and more UN Spider to climate because, you know, extreme uh, disasters, natural disasters are linked to the, the changing climate. And so there is a link between climate and disasters, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, all these projects um, are in a way created and in, in, in put in place because we see, we, we talk to the stakeholders in co continuously, we have a continuous contact with member states. So we are able to understand where there is a need in more than one country uh, to create a new initiative. This is, for example, a tip, the, the, the reason why we put together the Space Law for New Space Actor projects. 
um, which is quite a recent initiative, I would say a couple of years, but is gathering a lot of success from a political perspective, but also from the funding perspective. Uh, and, and we see synergies between developed and developing countries. And we currently have more than 25 requests already for uh, getting support and, and getting uh, training uh, in, in, in seminars, in institutional advisory missions, a lot of different things which are related to a project which uh, we understood was absolutely needed, but I have to admit it went beyond our expectations in terms of uh, interest showed by member states. So again, we see where uh, we, we try to understand where there is a need, we try to understand fully the need, and then either the solution is already available, space-based, or if not available, we try to work with our partners to, uh, to provide the, the solution space-based for the users and, and for, the, for the use of, of member states and their citizens. The next one, please. Well, uh, this is just to say that uh, as per today, space is everywhere. Uh, is uh, is really used for research, for climate, for disasters, for humanitarian support. Um, for we we have activities related uh, uh, to bringing really bridging the space divide but also to monitor uh, the, the, the water depletion or, or really to work uh, in order to uh, support uh, sustainability in space and trying to reduce or mitigate um, the, the number of debris or at least the effect of, of the increasing number of debris, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many topics that we are dealing with, but they are all uh, strictly interconnected, uh, in particular when we uh, want to talk about the global governance and who should be and how we should uh, put together a system at, at the global level which is able to provide information in a transparent and accountable manner to all the players in the world. The next one, please. A uh, specific mention to the Access to Space for All initiative, which started with some activities and then became a full initiative in 2018. Um, it's an example of cooperation between the uh, UN and all the potential stakeholders. You see here a certain number of space agencies. You have the China Man Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the German, uh, the German DLR, the space, uh, the, 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 the space uh, agency, the Japanese uh, Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and NASA. But we have also centers, for example, ZARM, the drop tower in, in Germany, but also the Kaldish Institute of Applied Mathematics in Russia. And then we have uh, private companies like Airbus, Avio, and Sierra Nevada Corporation coming from different uh, countries. So the idea here is that we um, have an, a triangular approach. So we um, sign agreements with um, partners coming from developed countries, uh, which offer through us to, in particular, developing and emerging countries, but not only, the possibility to fly CubeSats, experiments in orbit, but also to test their experiments on, on ground, and this is the case for the time being for the European Space Agency, where we use the centrifuge that they have in ESTEC in the Netherlands, the center in the Netherlands, but also ZARM, the drop tower in Germany, where we allow the winners of our selections uh, process, our, our announcement of opportunities to test their experiments for 20, 22 seconds of um, microgravity conditions in the in the ZARM drop tower. Um, we have nine experiments already selected, which will fly on board the China Man Space, uh, China Space Station uh, in 2022, probably uh, from 2022 onwards, when the, when the station will be ready. Uh, we have already a selection for the Bartolomeo platform provided. Uh, uh, we have certain slots on the Airbus uh, developed Bartolomeo platform on, uh, on out, outside on the 
Columbus module on the ISS, the International Space Station, etc., etc. Next one. In particular, uh, I would like to focus on uh, on uh, the PIBOQ project, which is part of Access to Space for All, thanks to uh, an agreement between uh, JAXA uh, and us, so the, the Japanese Space Agency and us. We um, allowed, through this, uh, Kenya to launch its first satellite in 2018, which was for the ever, uh, the first uh, the first satellite ever launched under the auspices of the United Nations. Then, thanks to the same Kibokyo program, we had Guatemala launching its first satellite last year during the full pandemic, mid last year. And now we will have uh, in June um, the next satellite, which is uh, developed by Mauritius with support of Indonesia. And uh, I, I just received uh, just a couple of days ago an update. The satellite is already uh, packed, I mean, really ready to go with SpaceX F-22 um, in June. And two or three days later, it will be deployed um, from the Kibo module on the ISS. And so also Mauritius will, um, will enter into the pool of the spacefaring countries, and it will be the third satellite ever launched um, under the auspices of the UN. These are several uh, pictures taken in, in various situations. This project is really, really um, uh, an interesting, um, how can I say, an interesting situation here because this project is uh, is getting more and more traction, and I really have to uh, commend uh, JAXA for their um, forward-looking approach. And uh, we will have, as you see, Moldova coming, and then Sika coming, and uh, and uh, we will select uh, other uh, satellites in in the next coming months. And again, this is done through a competitive process. Uh, we uh, we put on our website an announcement of opportunity. Then we lead the selection process. And when the team is selected and announced, then we leave uh, to the partner uh, the the responsibility of dealing with the selected team um, because then you enter into the technical uh, needs and it's also a, quite a good process in terms of capacity building on the on the job it's, it's really providing us JAXA and the winners a great added value and which is far higher than the value per se of the cost uh, of launching and or or operating uh, or doing the launch campaign, which is provided free of charge by JAXA in this case, uh, it's really uh, far higher in terms of value because this is um, in a way um, a combination of uh, different elements uh, supporting the team to grow in the field. So it's really a, an example of how capacity building in the 21st century should work. The next one, please. I mentioned already the space law for new space actors. For me, is uh, is one of the flagship initiatives in terms also of approach, and it's it's a sort of a role model also for the approach that that we are following. We have several uh, donors in this case. We have Belgium, Chile, Japan, Luxembourg, Secure World Foundation. Well, uh, and growing and counting, uh, and uh, we. Due, I mean, due to the fact that uh, we have been um, forced to stay at home uh, in, in 2020, not traveling, while we had already several uh, training and activities planned in several countries, well, we used the time to develop two e-learning modules. One is Introduction to Space Law for New Space Actors Projects, and the other one is the Outer Space Treaty and the fundamental principles of space law, both in English, French, and Spanish, which is also another important element because these three languages, English, French, and Spanish, are three out of six of the official languages of the United Nations. 
as you can imagine, translating and preparing e-learning courses in all the languages requires not only a lot of time, which is fine, but also a lot of money because the translation has to be certified. But I hope that very soon we could also expand uh, the number of languages in which these courses, uh, these e-learning courses are available. The next one, please. Well, instead, another important uh, pillar of what we are doing, um, which is quite new. Well, in 2019, I, I have to mention first that in 2019, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Other Space, they had a, a working group on the long-term sustainability of other space activities. Um, and uh, in June 2019, the, the preamble and the first 21 guidelines under LTS were finalized. Uh, and the General Assembly the same year in October, uh, in a way, welcomed with appreciation this effort. Um, and so last year, uh, end of last year, we started a, a project called Promoting Space Sustainability, Awareness Raising and Capacity Building to Support Implementation of the LTS Guidelines. It is uh, currently supported by the UK government. Uh, we signed an agreement with the UK Space Agency just before Christmas last year. And it's a multi-stakeholder project uh, with the idea of engaging public and private actors to raise awareness on the importance of space sustainability. Um, and this will allow us to gather and collate uh, really operational case studies that demonstrate implementation across relevant parts of the 21 LTS guidelines. And also uh, uh, these case studies um, are made uh, publicly available to help inform the wider community and also to support the tailoring of future capacity building activities to support the implementation of the LTS guidelines. The next one, please. Um, we had uh, quite uh, an interesting um, implementation of the phase one of the project. Uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, some webinars with over 800 registered participants, um, in particular for the, the opening three event series and speakers uh, uh, gathered from over 30 organizations in this first round. And, uh, and the detailed analysis of how space agencies are adjusting operations in orbit to enhance disposal and collision avoidance which is linked to guideline B4, and re-entry procedures, which is linked to guideline B9, but also a case study on how one public sector actor is working with the private sector, providing SSA data to track and monitor space objects licensing compliance, and this is guideline A3. Well, just these are just examples, um, and here I put, uh, to just two pictures of the screen. One was uh, from Airbus, so a presentation very well done from Airbus, and the other one, the New Zealand Space Agency, which is also supporting us a lot on other projects. Uh, and New Zealand is, is quite a good example of, uh, of a, um, a very good, uh, uh, let's say, the, the very good approach that they had since the very beginning. They joined um, the committee just a few years ago they developed uh, the national space law, they developed their own space agencies, they have Rocket Lab um, launching from New Zealand, and they became quite a role model in terms of how member states should support, if I may say so, uh, the, the work that we do. Uh, they immediately uh, funded us just after becoming members of COPUS, uh, a project uh, on a project to help the Pacific Island states to understand which kind of solutions space-based would be interesting for uh, for them, and uh, and it was interesting because we had really to do a, a lot of work together with the local authorities um, to understand uh, to understand their needs and their requirements because they were not aware that space can provide solutions could provide solutions to their to their needs. So now we are discussing phase two uh, and uh, with New Zealand. And again, um, we are always looking for good uh, uh, role models 
uh, in terms of bilateral cooperation, in terms of trilateral cooperation, in terms of multilateral cooperation. And we have several of these role models mechanisms, which is also good because we can always find the solution to an issue, space-based. Next one, please. Um, in reality, this is more on what we are going to do in the future, uh, even more, trying to increase uh, the awareness even more on the implementation of the LTS guidelines. We will continue to gather operational case studies in uh, making them publicly available to the international space community. And this is because um, the more we disseminate information on best practices and lessons learned, the better it is to decide how to proceed in the future. It's really important for member states to get to really have access to this information that we can gather because they will take more informed decisions in this manner. And therefore, is a way, as I was mentioning before, for us to serve member states even better than before. Um, we will uh, categorize, uh, we are categorizing and we will categorize case studies uh, across the four sections of the 21 LTS guidelines. And uh, the, the four sections are section A, policy and regulatory framework for space activities, section B, safety of space operations, section C, international cooperation, capacity building and awareness, and section D, scientific and technical research and development. Um, and it's, all of this is clearly, if we include the Register Convention, the UN Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines, all of this will bring us, let's say, a step, will, will bring us uh, even more closer to what we call the Global Space Governance global space government mechanisms or regime uh, depends on which word you prefer next one please so um it's clear that uh, when we talk about space sustainability this is really in becoming increasingly pers pervasive across the global space sector we uh, started last year an activity with the UAE, the UAE Space Agency, to conduct uh, the largest ever UN-led stakeholder engagement study on the subject. So we interviewed over 50 uh, leaders for the, from the public, private, uh, non-state fields of the international community, and we found some interesting elements for example that language counts in the sense that uh, one of the results of this of this engagement was that uh, uh, we we have been alerted on the need to work on expanding a common set of linguistic labels to break down the space sustainability policy challenge into components well very good suggestion uh, most of the people interviewed if not all are extremely interested in, in, uh, in con they really consider raising awareness as the key activity, so something that we should uh, even reinforce. Um, also, uh, it was uh, clear that uh, we need to control and predict, uh, and so we need to establish internationally recognized metrics for quantitative analysis of space sustainability trends, and also that, that in a way we have to incentivize incentivize uh, the commercial sector uh, because the commercial sector must remain part of the solution. I'm fully convinced about that, but this study is reinforcing this this uh, approach, and uh, and also that the economic aspect of enhanced space sustainability should be highlighted. In other words, and again, I'm fully convinced, but this is confirming. Um, the space sustainability, dealing with space debris, uh, having a global uh, governance system is uh, a prerequisite for uh, commercial players to see, um, 
to see their activities uh, developed in 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 and becoming operational for a long period of time so that they can really have and present uh, solid business plans solid business models so that their um potential um the venture capitalists the the financial supporters the donors they can really support these activities uh uh, knowing that the system is in place to ensure a commercial safe space and so that the commercial operators can really work in space in a safe manner. The next one, please. So if we look at the situation right now, uh, we have to say that uh, uh, we have different mandates, responsibility. We work with member states to promote responsible and sustainable use of what the Outer Space Treaty mentioned as the province of all humankind. Well, I mentioned already that we maintain the register of the objects launched into outer space, that uh, we uh, provide implementation support services on the LTS guidelines. We really do a lot in space low capacity building, and we also engage with a lot of different stakeholders on space debris, for example, uh, we had quite an interesting uh, campaign together with the European Space Agency on space debris. We uh, discussed, we, we published infographics and podcasts um, on the topic, and, and really, I can tell you, was well perceived uh, by the public and followed quite strictly. Uh, the, um, the also, I'd like to mention that, for example, just example, we partnered with uh, with ICAO. And we had uh, in the time frame 2015 2017 uh, a set of symposia uh, which were organized in Montreal, Dubai, and Vienna, uh, exactly dealing with aerospace. So, just to work together in a field which may have uh, a few areas of overlaps. And, uh, um, and also, I, I believe that uh, this is, um, this is. Uh, giving this is giving you also the feeling of um how inclusive we want to be uh these are fields in which uh you cannot work in silos and the more um we are able to involve the other partners uh because clearly why we have so many partners because we are dealing with so many topics with all the topics related to space affairs that there is always someone else who is working in the same field uh, also very often from a different angle and so we really multiply the 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 uh, the, the, the efficiency of the system in particular the the the, re the efficiency and the relevance of what we do uh with all these partnerships that, that by the way are, gi are giving us a lot of um uh, satisfaction but i believe this is also the way in which member states want us to work with with the other stakeholders the next one please Um, we also uh, have been the, 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 the home, in particular the committee, uh, in developing international space law. We have currently five treaties, five principles of outer space, space debris mitigation guidelines, the LTS guidelines, mentioned already too many times. Then we have the two subcommittees, the, the one dealing with scientific and technical topics and the other one dealing with, legal, uh, with the legal topics. And uh, by the way, the legal subcommittee, the session this year, will start on the 31st of May for two weeks. Uh, and clearly uh, the discussion is, is, is surrounding the topic of how to ensure that the international legal space framework remains fit for purpose. And, uh, and also it's important to notice that in Vienna we use the um, consensus mode, which means that we don't vote and each decision is taken by consensus. It's also important to notice that the membership of the committee uh, is increasing uh, quite uh, quite uh, steep. Uh, we started with 18 member states. Um, in um, six years ago, we were 76. In the last few years, we reached 95 with an increase of about 25%. We have already three additional um, applications this year in others in the pipeline. So I believe I can reach one of my informal goals which was to reach 100 by the year 2020. Unfortunately, 
2020 cannot be counted because um, the, the the process has been disrupted a little bit by the the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, with one year delay uh, due to let's say uh, reasons which we are uh, not under our control, I hope that we can reach this goal, which means still that we are half the way because. Uh, because, as I said, we have 193 member states in in the in the United Nations. But okay, uh, from 75 to 100 in just few years means really a huge uh, increase. And uh, and at the same time, we reached 42 permanent observers and counting. Because also this year we have additional applications. The next one, please. Um, if we want to talk now a little bit about the future, so how we are preparing for the multilateral uh, space traffic management related debates. Um, well, uh, we believe that there is a need of developing an acceptable, effective, fair and an equitable solution uh, for space traffic management. And this requires a multilateral approach at the United Nations level. In reality, the discussion started back in 2006 when the International um, Astro uh, Academy of Astronautics uh, presented a cosmic study. Uh, it's one of the cosmic studies, a typical study that, that, that IAA does. And uh, it was a study on space traffic management presented at the committee. Then we had several activities, the guidelines, um, the fact that uh, in 2016, a new agenda item on legal subcommittee dealing with with, um, with the legal aspect of STM was introduced. Then we had in 2019 the first 21 guidelines approved. And now discussions are ongoing on how to proceed. But for sure, what I strongly believe is this multilateral normative framework must remain fit for purpose. That's absolutely mandatory. The next one, please. So if we look at the future of global space traffic management, um, we believe that the rules must be comprehensive, detailed, inclusive, uh, and then we do need the UN the, uh, through the General Assembly, the committee, UNUSA, all together and together with all the stakeholders. So uh, expanding the COPUS membership database, I mean, the, 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 the base, the number of members in the committee will also help this process. The more we are, the better it is. And so that's also one of the reasons why I'm welcoming uh, more and more member states uh, applying for becoming members of the committee. It's also extremely important that we share in a multilateral, with a multilateral approach, all the information related to the space situation or the space domain awareness. Uh, because this improves safety and sustainability. We do need to enhance the registration practices because we need to cope with the exponential growth of objects launched into outer space. And also uh, we need international mechanisms for notification and coordination. And uh, we, uh, we really want to continue convening all actors uh, and, and to provide platforms for discussions between all the stakeholders because each of us, each player, need to be really in line with the new rules of the orbit. I mean, it's, it's, the, I mean, it's, it's in a way extrapolated from the rules of the road, the rules of the orbit, as, as we say. So um, if we implement the existing normative framework, including the LTS guidelines, uh, we may need to enhance the practices, the key practices required for an international STM. The next one, please. So, uh, yes, which means that uh, we are really looking at 2021 uh, as, um, if you want, a key year to uh, shape the future of the activities under the umbrella of the UN. Um, and uh, it's becoming more and more because, you know, COPUS we talked about already, debris we talked about already, uh, launching in and allowing member states to launch their first satellite, support their hands-on experiences, is we talked about that already with the access to space for all. 
Uh, but there is also a back to the moon is, is now the exploration of the solar system, which is the new the new uh, wave, or not the new wave, but the, 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 it's really opening up in a, in a strong manner. We have more and more countries uh, either already um, able to go to the moon or to Mars or uh, ready to, I mean, to start implementing programs in that direction. Um, and, uh, and so it's extremely important also from the governance standpoint that we start including other celestial bodies, not only uh, the, the low Earth orbit or, or geostationary orbits into the equation. So we are going from one domain to more domains probably in the very near future. And this is also something that we have to consider carefully. Next one, please. And so just to conclude, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, all of this is also done with the with an eye of uh, really bringing the benefits of space to everyone everywhere, uh, which means that uh, this is in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that we don't want to leave anyone behind. It's a long process. Um, we do need support in terms of also financial and human resources, but in particular from a political perspective, because we are now entering into a, a period in which we will have a lot of discussions at very top level uh, from a political perspective. And therefore, uh, the understanding of more and more member states that and more and more stakeholders that there is a need of a global space governance framework, mechanism, regime, call it as you like, uh, under the umbrella of the UN, where we can really support member states more and more and all the players more and more to develop a commercial safe space. Well, this is the key. And I hope that uh, this will be done um, rapidly because there is really the need of uh, clarifying the rules of the orbit and we have to do it all together. And thank you very much for listening. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we have actually a lot of questions. Uh, so I would suggest to start right away. Um, the first one is, uh, you mentioned before that uh, um, the commercial sector should be involved more in the discussion. And uh, part of the audience asks uh, um, how this could be done, also the, like the involvement of the commercial sector also in the policy and decision making in an institutional framework and whether this is, of course, uh, the UN framework and what exact mechanism could be used. Okay, so that's easy on one side because I can tell you what we, uh, we did and we continue to do. So we created uh, uh, platforms, uh, in particular one, which is the World Space Forum, um, which was not existing before. We started with uh, a, let's say, a lower version, a weaker version called High Level Forum in 2015. But then two years ago, we moved to the World Space Forum approach, which is growing and growing every year. And the idea is really to put together all the stakeholders with um, two or three days discussions. This year, we will probably have also in Vienna, will be in December, a, a ministerial section. So just to tell you that every year we go higher. Uh, and we put together space agencies, uh, all the stakeholders, the private sector. So um, we organize uh, very good uh, debates uh, on different topics where we involve all the potential uh, interest stakeholders, but for example, we have also specific initiatives. I don't know. We have the space economy initiative where we listen a lot uh, to to the uh, to the private sector. Or uh, uh, just another example, we have a case, uh, a project uh, or a topic that we have to deal with called dark and quiet skies, with more um, looking at how uh, mega constellations, for example, can impact uh, in a negative manner all the uh, astronomical observations from Earth. And we had a discussion at the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee and the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee asked us to the Office for Outer Space Affairs to work with the IAU, the International Astronautical Union, 
uh, and other players to see what can be done in order to preserve both. So support mega constellations for because it's it's for sure important, and at the same time support the 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 needs, the requirements, and also the complaints in a way of the astronomical uh, and let's say community. Well, this is a clear example where we need we are the only ones have, a, able to bring the private sector and the astronomers at the same table. Uh, we have the ability really to create uh, initiative, webinars, events, workshops, depends on the case, where we put them together. And it's also extremely important because one, in my opinion, I've always been convinced that if you want to find a solution, which is a win-win solution, when you have two counterparts, well, you need to find the best solution for the two. It cannot be that one wins and the other one uh, is is um, is less uh, is less satisfied is satisfied of, of this negotiation. It must be something uh, that helps the two uh, being uh, yeah satisfied. And that's uh, the way in which we always do things. And I I have to say it always worked. It always worked very well in my in my professional career. And now at the UN it works even better. So um, we are in contact with all the main players, SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, you name them, OneWeb, uh, plus the, the historical uh, companies. Uh, and, uh, and in this manner, we really bring them to, to the table. I have to say they are very respectful of the international framework. Um, but at the same time, they recognize the fact that um, these rules of the road need to be uh, rules of the orbit needs to be finalized the sooner the better because they are they they have a commercial mind and so they have to do to develop their business which is absolutely understandable at the same time thanks to the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the fact that there was a push from member states to uh i mean for for un entities to deal also with the private sector with partnerships and things like that we became really, we put together quite a good process internally uh, to be able to uh, sign partnerships with the private sector. I've shown you already a few of them. So the big companies, Sierra Nevada, it's, it's quite a big company in the, you know, in the US. Okay, Airbus uh, is, is quite well known in Europe and, and Avio is, is, is because it's developing this uh, uh, Vega C, uh, one of the, of the most important launchers in the European uh, landscape. And, uh, and we are, uh, uh, let's say, leveraging on their offers, the very, very gentle and kind offers. Um, and so we do, as I said, this announcement of opportunities, we select payloads and then they fly free of charge, uh, depending on the, uh, on, the, on the platform offered. So there is also, uh, if, if I may, I have to recognize the fact that these companies are really also supporting this approach in a very, a responsible manner so i really want to commend them i have another question which is actually linked to the various sponsorship um solutions that you mentioned and it is a bit uh, um is really i think it's a question from uh, one of our students um trying to um understand better how it works because of course um you know that works on the basis of neutrality but the sponsorship uh, does it affect then in any way also the implementation then of its action or not and how would you reconcile the sponsorship with neutrality um the also the question is in this case by our student whether it has ever happened that any type of sponsorship has raised concerns also within then the broader um uh, group of member states uh, I have to say it, I don't understand the question uh, too well, but I'll try to reply in any case. Yes, for sure, uh, neutrality is, is the main point, which means that we have to work uh, with all the countries and all the sponsors and all the donors, uh, which fit into, uh, on one side, the ethical values of the UN, so the core values, and at the same time uh, are under uh, our mandates. We always uh, work uh, and every time we, we find, uh, I mean, an interesting partner, 
then we always uh, look at the one or, or more than one mandates that we are fulfilling with that. Now, uh, the, the, the office, like all the other UN entities, at least in the Secretariat, but this is true for all the other UN entities, um, we can uh, put forward our activities in two manners. We have some a small contribution uh, called regular budget, uh, and we are part of the regular budget of the UN Secretariat. In a section and a program uh, under the, you know, the, the big umbrella of the regular budget of the Secretariat, which, as you know, is um, in, a, in a zero grow mode since quite a bit. Um, and then there is uh, the other part of our budget, which is uh, based on voluntary contributions. Uh, and uh, what we do, for example, if you look at the uh, at the access to space for all initiative, you see that we have everyone. Uh, so there are uh, different companies from different countries. Uh, the space agencies you have the European Space Agency, the Japanese, NASA, CMSA, so that the Chinese, uh, everyone is there. Huh? Uh, everyone who really wants to contribute, uh, because uh, it's, uh, they also want to, I mean, they, they need to be in the position to contribute because for them is either in kind or cash is, is money that they provide or support that they provide to us, but not to us, to developing countries. So to be very honest, I would really commend all of them for the effort they are putting in this. If you look at JAXA, what they did in the last few years. And also, I mean, nine experiments uh, all over the world, scientific experiments selected after one year back and forth um, to fly free of charge, more or less, on the China space station. And then at the same time, a satellites launched from the Kibo module on the ISS. And then the, the recent agreement with NASA or the centrifuge of ESA, et cetera, et cetera, it shows that in reality, what we are trying to do is to cover different fields. If you see, we have a centrifuge, we have a drop tower, we have an external platform, we have uh, cube cells launched, uh, deployed by the space from the space station. We have experiments inside another space station. We have the Keldish uh, Institute supporting um, uh, developing countries, students from developing countries in particular. Uh, with, with telescopes and things like that. So it's really covering all the possible fields and growing. Eh? So in reality, and, and we don't, don't spend, we really with one single uh, euros or dollars or whatever, because it's the contribution that they give to them through us. So uh, it, it's, it's uh, clearly we always evaluate everything. If it is a company, we have a very, very detailed process. So we do a due diligence, we an internal due diligence. We ensure that they are fully aligned with a certain number of criteria. Um, we monitor the situation. So it's really, really uh, quite well structured, the process. And by the way, most of the documents, you can find them on our website. Thank you for the very extensive uh, answer. I think actually that the question related really to whether the country can affect then the, the decision, which is not the case, absolutely. Um, then we have another question always from uh, one of our students, uh, which is about uh, what are the um, initiatives uh, sponsored by UNUSA to um, ensure uh, an equitable access to space uh, to developing country in light of the constant rise of satellite constellations and increased numbers of space objects launched. So whether there is uh, it, uh, like um, some working groups that address this, uh, this, um, this problem in the end, this issue. So the issue being that uh, we support uh, developing countries to get access to space. Yes. And, uh, constellations. Well, uh, well the, the answer is, is based on the, on the question uh, that you raised uh, before. So we need, we want to be uh, really balanced and, and neutral. 
And so we do believe, uh, I'm, I'm fully convinced, that space is a driver for socioeconomical uh, development. So the fact that there are countries developing or, or, or privates, private people developing mega constellations, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, developing countries should not do the same. Because, you know, developing a satellite means a lot of added value uh, because students are more looking at STEM education. The STEM education, STEM fields um, are important for socioeconomical development, uh, sustainable development in a certain country. Uh, access to space helps in developing also hands-on experience and therefore also international cooperation and getting more and more momentum so more people in the country are interested in this, let's say, in innovative and innovation related field, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you launch a satellite, well, you start with communication because always helpful in, in your country. And then uh, you do a little bit of earth observation, which can help in agriculture, in, in monitoring your sea level rise, uh, et cetera, et cetera, disasters, et cetera. So, and then you develop technologies and then you are able to sit at the table with the other partners. And so it's also a tool for space. Dip space diplomacy is a tool, in a way, for maintaining the peaceful uses, not only in space, but also on Earth. So, no, we really need to support everyone in a very diplo uh, the diplomatic, but also democratic manner. The more players we have, the better it is. And this, I think, is also a short true consensus within then the decision-making process. Okay, uh, we have then another question, and this uh, actually relates more to STM integration because you mentioned that, um, of course, and I fully agree on that, uh, the development of an acceptable, uh, effective, fair and equitable solution require multilateral approach, and that is very much the case also with STM. However, we have a lot of independent initiatives also at the level of national states and through national a policy and law regulation, which could in the end jeopardize uh, um, the a, a multilateral approach, at least in the um, decision maker, but also in the definition of the different concepts. And Good. there, um, my question is, uh, how could we prevent this from happening? Um, should uh, Really, COPUS take the lead uh, um, in, uh, in trying to reconcile the different views. Uh, should we wait for everyone to develop its own different initiatives and then try to come to a common ground of understanding what is, in this uh, multilateral approach, the best uh, um, approach to follow, in your opinion? So, arriving at a later stage or, like, right now at a quite infant stage, because for Europe, for instance, uh, we are still at the beginning. For some other countries, they are a bit more developed, uh, also in terms of concepts. Well, uh, I'm always in favor of, of uh, people discussing, uh, debating, uh, analyzing, uh, because the more um, assessed is a certain topic, the better it is, because it's easier then to find a compromise, you know? And at the very end, uh, uh, I don't see so many uh, initiatives which are in contrast with what the COPUS is doing. Um, it's, it's a question sometimes of interpretation, but I can assure you that every single member state uh, with this approach of, um, uh, of approving, for example, the LTS guidelines word by word, really, word by word, even if it's not binding, but the guidelines are guidelines, huh? so even if they are not binding, they are fully committed to follow uh, the, the what they approved. That's the reason why I'm fully convinced that the first step is, the first step in parallel to others, so it's a first step, but in parallel, is to enlarge the membership of COPUS because it's where the multilateral discussions take place. And the problem is not necessarily, uh, I see some, sometimes that there is the tendency of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, looking at the, at the spacefaring countries. Well, the spacefaring countries are the most organized 
from uh, the national space uh, law standpoint and things like that. But we have countries which already launched a certain number of satellites in orbit, but for example, they don't have a national space law and they don't have a national space authority able then to certify to us under the, the register of the object launch into outer space the fact that they have launched the satellites and we're talking about not necessarily only developing countries so the point is that we also have to stress the fact that together with the multilateral approach which is mandatory also at national level they have to develop their own uh features elements uh, that's the reason why i was mentioning new zealand as a role model they did exactly everything they had to do they started more or less uh in, in even more if i may i always say in that that they know quite well they became again just a few years ago member of copos and at the same time developed national space law and um and the national space agency yes so one may say yes because rubber lab went there and wanted to launch so they needed a national space law yes but still the fact is that they did exactly what they had to do in the right order and very quickly however we have countries that don't have a national space law to manage internally and to provide licenses and to and to support also the registration of these objects so we also have to work with member states at national level and that's the importance of the space law for new space actors because that project helps us helps us in helping them in developing their national space policy which are it's absolutely mandatory to complement the multilateral approach yep we have another question from our one of our students uh, which is whether do you foresee that the exploitation of space resources uh, could uh, um today become a driver for reviewing the outer space treaty for also working on the interpretation of some elements of the outer space treaty in light of the scarce um, um, consistency at least of approaches to for instance the moon agreement uh, and so on and how do you see the evolution in this regard of the space law regime within the UN framework with regard to new um, challenges for space exploration well um it's clear that when when all these documents and all these treaties have been discussed and, and agreed the situation was different and uh, this is always true in in a lot of different things however uh, the outer space treaty maintains in my personal opinion its full strength it's a foundation document uh together with the others is a very good set of uh, of uh, let's say the the fun the fundamental principles are there uh, it's also true that the situation, as I said, is different and member states uh, are, are recognizing that the situation is different and also recognizing that there is a need of discussing what to do, uh, considering that there is also a potential commercial interest and, and therefore uh, defining the rules of the orbit or defining the rules of the road more in general um, may be helpful to do it sooner than later, better sooner than later. Now. Um, again, the process sometimes may sound long because all member states decide really word by word what they uh, approve. But again, and I, I will stress always this concept, even if it sounds sometimes uh, long, it's in reality very, very um, effective. The efficiency of the system is very high exactly for this reason it's not the, the guidelines has nothing to do with the treaty it's a completely different story but member states won't really i mean they feel that they have to be committed to that so the more country the more countries we have at the table in corpus the more they approve and participate to the process the more they will be linked to that and so reviewing the treaties will not be needed in principle, huh? then it's not up uh, to me to decide. So member states can decide to change the treaty, but yeah, to reopen the discussion. But frankly, from a poor technical perspective, probably it's not needed. And also it's quite in contrast also what is practiced in international law uh, towards our law instruments. So, um, 
I, we then have another question, uh, which is actually a clarification from the audience. Uh, because you mentioned the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, uh, and uh, um, one of the attendees wanted to know um, what is its relationship with other uh, instruments of uh, situational awareness in space that are developed uh, at the national or intergovernmental level, whether there is any in this case, or whether there, there will be something like that from the technical perspective. The question is, if we are planning to have a system similar to SEMPAGE, which is dealing with planetary defense, mm -hmm. uh, related to SSA, SST? That's the yes. question? Yes, okay. so we have an international coordination mechanism in this case. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I would love to see that, uh, to be very honest, and it's part, in my opinion, the discussion around uh, the global space governance uh, mechanism, because you cannot do uh, space governance and space traffic management without SSA, SST. And, uh, and now, uh, to be very honest, again, uh, the, the, the same page, for example, in planetary defense is working very well because we are able to federate all the efforts, all the knowledge, all the activities of the main space agencies in the field. Well, why not the same approach? In my opinion, a very good role model, and I may invite you to, to look at, the, at, at how it works, is ICG. ICG, the International Committee on, on GNSS, is really a gem. Huh? Uh, and, uh, and it's an idea that, in my opinion, could fit quite well in, in, this, in this field because the responsibility is fully at national level, hmm? but the, mechan the, the coordination, mechan the interoperability, the interoperability of the GNSS system will help, it's helping already in terms of uh, in ICG because Instead of having uh, four GPS satellite only, you can access at the same time if you have the right, uh, the right, uh, let's say, hardware. You you can access uh, at the same time. They do GLONASS, uh, uh, GPS, Galileo, and you name them. I mean, already the the, the iWatch, uh, the, the 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 Apple Watch, the, I believe it's already GLONASS and GPS, and probably a certain point in time, also Galileo, and and they do which means that the precision of the information, the number of satellites in coverage, et cetera, et cetera, goes higher. And so the applications that you can develop just with the same, the same systems, not doing nothing, apart pushing a little bit uh, the market in developing the right hardware to be able to, to be connected with the more than one constellation. And then you get service applications which were not even in the dreams of anyone just a few years ago. And at the very end, it's also a sort of a transparency and confidence building measure because the providers come at the same table and work together, maintaining the requirements and the needs they have at national level on their own constellations. It's a wonderful model. Yeah, and this could also foster maybe a process of international standardization, which could definitely in the end help. So for SSA, SST, which means STM, the basis for STM, well, this could be the model, could be a model. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the one, but from a technical perspective, it could be a model. Mm -hmm. We then have another question with regard to um, registration of space objects. Uh, and of course, this is actually quite a potential problem for the future, both in light of the amount of objects that will be launched, but also with regard to the information regarding that object that will be shared, because here, if those are not uh, extensive, for sure, and there is no obligation in this regard, um, misperception can definitely increase. Um, is there any, except the fact that, of course, there is an invitation to all the states to constantly register and also an obligation in this regard for all those who adopted the uh, registration also. convention. Um, are there any other uh, instruments in place that the UN could sponsor and promote to increase the registration mechanism? Okay, there are two levels. The first one is how to cope uh, with the increasing number of information that we receive due to the 
increasing number of, of objects launched. And this is something that we can do uh, under the umbrella of the current mandate. And we are currently working on, uh, on uh, a proposal, internal proposal to update or upgrade uh, the website and also being a little bit more modern in supporting member states in the way in which they can notify us of the information they want. Because what they do, they provide us with the information, then we check the information, and then sometimes we just publish. In other cases, we need to go back and discuss uh, because it could be that sometimes the information are not precise. I mean, sometimes it's just a question that they type the wrong the wrong uh, coordinates or things like that uh, something like that but uh, i have to say yes we can have a few cases here and there where we don't agree and it takes a bit of time to be published but usually it works well the other point with the with the registration uh, convention is that um there are member states which um register each object launched immediately after in particular this is true for uh, for the, the countries which don't launch so much. And then there are others which put uh, uh, all the information in batches because, you know, they are processing so many, I mean, <laughs> tens of satellites that instead of sending us every time a notification, they put them all in batches and it's every three months, every six months. So, fine. So at the very end, uh, this is something that we can discuss with them. It's not a big deal. Um, if instead we enter into the discussion about uh, registering, for example, in-orbit maneuver, re-entry maneuvers, pre-launch notifications, well, this is an area that currently is not covered by the registration convention, which doesn't mean that a single state can decide to inform us about a re-entry maneuver or an in-orbit maneuver. Huh? They are free to do whatever they like. However, this is not part of the registration convention and is probably part of something that has to be discussed under the umbrella of the new guidelines, LTS, could be. Uh, under, let's say, the need of, uh, of creating, uh, uh, let's say, a new process, could be. For sure, it's part of the bigger discussion on global go space governance. We cannot, we cannot understand what is going on without having uh, under control in orbit maneuver, re entry maneuver, and, like, uh, and even pre launch notification will, will help a lot. And with regard to the long term sustainability guidelines uh, and the upcoming process for those that were agreement was not reached, one of our attendees asked, uh, um, in your opinion, uh, which is personal opinion probably think are the most urgent topics that should be addressed in future guidelines. We can clearly see about registration. This is the, but also sharing of information. I think it's another, even though some guidelines actually can already be very effective already in sharing information of the adopted ones. Yeah, if you look at guidelines B1, uh, there is a clear mention of the fact that we have to, uh, to disseminate information and the projects that I mentioned uh, are are you know the first uh, the the first uh, the first step? Well, you have to consider that uh, it sounds like one year and a half ago when they've been uh, uh, endorsed by the GA, but uh, immediately after we started to discuss with member states, then we had the pandemic, and still we have been able to sign agreements during the pandemic with the UAE Space Agency, with the UK Space Agency, uh, with a lot of other uh, entities, but talking about dissemination of information under the umbrella of uh, LTS and space sustainability, still in the pandemic, during the pandemic, we have been able to negotiate and to agree uh, on this uh, funding agreements with these two entities and counting. We did the, uh, the study, we did the webinars. So um, it may sound a lot of time, it's not. We did the huge uh, work and a, and a big step ahead uh, despite the difficult situation. So I'm quite confident that uh, still this year, you know, um, we have to work in an hybrid manner. Uh, people cannot travel. So it will still, it, it's okay. Uh, Corpus, uh, we had the scientific and technical subcommittee in an hybrid mode. It worked well. 
but it's, it's also clear that when you have to take uh, difficult decisions where you really need to negotiate uh, word by word the text, well, it's a bit better if people are in the same room. So I expect this year still um, that we will do a lot, uh, but probably we will have to wait 2022 to the full reboost of the activity. At the same time, there are a lot of initiatives uh, at European level and the US in other countries dealing with the space traffic management conferences uh, um, in, in papers and pilot projects. So the, 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 the situation is evolving and is improving. And, uh, and I believe that uh, also guideline B1 is recognizing the role of the Office for Outer Space Affairs and more and more. And this means that we can really be in the position now, we are really in the position now to help member states because as I said, dissemination, transparency, accountability, all of this, credibility, also the information because you need someone who's able to certify what is published, which is not necessarily given for granted. Well, uh, all of this is, is, is growing and reinforcing. And so it's fine. It takes time, but it's going the right direction. Uh, we have another question actually about uh, um, women in space, space for women actually. Um, and there is uh, um, what concretely are the projects that uh, UNOSA is supporting or is uh, um, promoting um, to uh, boost uh, also the access of women to technological, um, to STEM or to other, um, to the space science, because in fact here there is a huge gender gap. And here, what, how is, uh, uh, what are the plans for UNUSA to promote uh, bridging this gap? Well, uh, the, the Space for Women project is, is one of the projects that we started after uh, September 2015, when the 2030 Agenda was approved. Uh, again, we wanted to target SDG 4, Quality Education, and SDG 5, uh, Gender Empowerment. Uh, or equality, and the two together uh, brought us to create Space for Women. Well, Space for Women is, is quite articulated because we just launched one year ago uh, the website. Uh, we started last year with a network of mentors, which uh, the, the mentors are selected uh, through a selection process. Um, and uh, because the idea is to have mentors distributed all over the world, because they can reach out better people in their regions. Eh? Uh, and in particular, this strategy uh, sounded very good because at the same time, I mean, just after having selected the 25 uh, first set of mentors, well, we enter into lockdown. So uh, it was, it, it, it ended to be a very, very good, uh, um, even more, I mean, beyond expectations solution. Uh, we then had, uh, just a couple of months ago, a sort of uh, a lesson learned two days uh, meeting with all the, the mentors uh, to see um, what was good, what had to be changed, which kind of approach we should have had in the second round, in the second call uh, for opportunity, yeah? because again, it's a selective process. Um, which is currently in, in, uh, in the process, I mean, in the, the pipeline. We, we did the announcement, we received the applications, and we are now working in, um, in the, on the selection of the second round. Uh, and so uh, this implies that this is a platform which is bringing really uh, the, the, the girls and, and young women to in contact with senior uh, women, but not necessarily only women, um, so best practices are collected, uh, the website is extremely important, and in the future if we collect money, because this is absolutely needed, we may even think about, for example, some grants for researchers or, or some uh, um, financial support for, uh, for going to universities or things like that. Um, Personally, I believe that we should start focusing on, um, on, uh, on really young girls, uh, 8, 8, 12, 13 uh, years old, because that's a moment in particular in certain types of societies where you have uh, 
the social condition, I mean, the social conditions will have a lot of influence in, in, in young girls uh, thinking that they are not fit for purpose for STEM education, which is probably one of the worst uh, thing I ever heard in my life. But unfortunately, it happens. And so, uh, but for the time being, we don't have human and financial resources to, uh, to focus also on that. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, what we do, we have a focal point for streamlining uh, for, for the Shamudis uh, gender uh, policies, which means that we really strive to bring more and more women at the table when we do capacity building activities, when we do webinars. Um, and I am personally against the uh, topic of uh, uh, in a panel, you need to have at least one, uh, one woman or at least one man. Well, it depends on, on the type of, of uh, topic. I have to, to say, however, that in our panels, uh, very often you have uh, either a balanced representation. Sometimes you can have more women. The other time you can have more men. But there is always a balanced representation if you select people based on the merit. And frankly, uh, it's a, it's a, I, I don't believe that the argument we don't have women uh, good enough in a certain field, uh, considering that space is quite, you know, <laughs> quite difficult as a field, if I may. Uh, well, um, we, we don't find that the, the, this issue. It's just a question of uh, really having a policy for streamlining. And it works very well. And in fact, for example, I, I, I don't consider proper this idea of uh, checking who is in the panel to decide if I want to attend or not. I attend or not, depending on the panel and depending on what I have to say. And if the panel is in line with the, with the policy of a leader in the UN of attending, I mean, it's, it's uh, Clearly, if uh, there are uh, 25 men and, and, and one woman, well, I noticed that. But that's uh, that's, uh, that's uh, it's sometimes I was on the line because it cannot be that you can you, you don't you don't find uh, women at, at the proper level. Um, however, however, there is a, a quite an interesting topic that is difficult then to to analyze in in just few words, but the situation uh, and the issues that you can find in developed countries are completely different from the situations that you can find in developing and emerging countries and so the method may be maybe need to be differentiated at a certain point in time huh? uh, for the time being the method that we are putting in place applies also to men uh, so it's not uh, even if it's specific specifically tailored at least in terms of mentors uh, for women but the, the the approach is the same i fully convinced that stem education is the future of the planet uh, and not necessarily in space but in general supported by all the other fields because the again the future of jobs and the talent uh, the, the, what what the economist a few years ago called the wars of talent uh, well, it's it's really there where we have to look, and uh, and merit can only it's it's the only element, the only let's say uh, important element that you can consider to build the, the the your team for the future. I can't agree more on this. Um, I have uh, another question, uh, um, which is it was very interesting actually the project you mentioned before the partnership with the. Uh, UA Space Agency um, with, to conduct this uh, this um, UK-led stakeholder engagement, and um, we had a question on what will be the follow-up of the if any of this partnership because it's extremely interesting also in uh, using uh, if you if I may the UN was a platform uh, like uh, instrument uh, to um, to improve stakeholder consultations because through that I think you can really identify the, the gaps then to tackle from a policy and legal perspective. So, yeah now um, on both studies uh, we are now analyzing together with the partners so one side UK space agency together with the government and on the other side the UAE space agency together with the government um, to see how the results of the respective studies, uh, where we they will bring us, because uh, they already committed to a phase two, both of them, 
And this phase two will be uh, fine tuned uh, on the basis of the results. And we are currently in the phase of in 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 the in the, in the, let's say in, the, in in that period where we are finalizing the the technical content of this phase two for both studies. But they committed already verbally to the fact that uh, uh, they want to continue that they absolutely uh, the result is absolutely outstanding in both cases. It may be that uh, UAE will turn a little bit more uh, to space economy, so link in space sustainability mm -hmm. to space economy, mm -hmm. which is absolutely fantastic for me, uh, considering also the, let's say, the approach of the, the UAE in general as government. Um, and uh, and uh, while the, the, the one with the UK Space Agency will be probably a phase two, reinforcing the approach uh, taken in space one but we're still discussing so i don't want to anticipate something that will not be the final result of these conversations i think we are at the end of our um, webinar we have other questions but uh, um, we yeah. can i can send it to you privately those questions um, it was really an excellent presentation and we really had a lot of questions in fact uh, before uh, closing the webinar uh, let me remind to everyone that this um, lecture was recorded and it will be published on our um, GGS Woven uh, YouTube channel it will also be published on our new Jean Monnet Center of Excellence website um, spacegovernance.eu tomorrow we will have the uh, last actually lecture of our other lecture series on the role of the European Union in fostering um, a space ecosystem with uh, uh, Mr. Stefano Fiorini from the European Space Agency. Um, we really hope to host you also next year for the other another round of, of lecture series that we will organize on space governance. It was really an excellent presentation, this one, and also the conversations with Peter Martinez. If you didn't uh, see it from the attendees, please go back to that because it's a really accurate also um, description of the uh, ATS process and uh, the way forward to its implementation. Uh, and with this, we really thank you again for, for the opportunity to, to have you here as a, as a distinguished speaker. It was really an excellent presentation. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.